When I say the word guardians, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Ha! No loser, you conformist, you fucking idiot! There is only one correct answer to that question. Twenty twelve was a mixed bag of a year for movies. We got some awesome stuff like Django Unchained, Skyfall, Avengers, Paranorman, Wreck It Ralph, Moonrise Kingdom, Argo, and Lincoln, but we also got Dark Knight Rises, Amazing Spider Man, Hobbit Unexpected Journey, Snow White and the Huntsman, Battleship, The Lorax. But amidst this flurry of good and bad titles, Rise of the Guardian snuck by in November without leaving an impact at the box office nor on moviegoers, which is why it quickly became one of the most criminally underrated animated films ever, along with many others that I plan on covering in this new segment. This film is one of those properties that gained an extremely devoted following on Tumblr and petered out when Tumblr fell into the dark recesses of the internet's subconscious never to resurface nor forgiven for its sins against humanity. But this film is so much more than its Tumblr popularity. This is a beautifully animated, emotionally engaging, exceptionally creative story that we need to get more people watching. And here's why. Oh, by the way, major crucial spoilers ahead, so if you don't want that, here's your warning. Bada bing, bada boom, bada bing, bang, boom. Rise of the Guardians tells the story of Jack Frost who for 300 years has provided fun and happiness to the children in the wintertime. Even though the idea of Jack Frost is referred to more as an expression by the humans and less of an actual spirit. We don't want Jack Frost nipping at your nose. <gasps> Who's Jack Frost? No one, honey. It's just an expression. Hey. However, Jack is seen as a delinquent among the Guardians, such as North, Bunnymun, and Sandy. Except Tooth. Tooth thinks Jack is hot. Hello, Jack. I've heard a lot about you. And your teeth! My, my what? Open up! Are they really as white as they say? Yes! <gasps> oh, they really do sparkle like freshly fallen snow. Girls, pull yourselves together. Let's not disgrace the uniform. The Guardians answer to the Man in the Moon, who is basically God in this universe. He chose the Guardians to maintain peace and protect the children of Earth from danger. But the infamous boogeyman named Pitch, played dashingly by Jude Law, starts plaguing children's dreams with horrific nightmares and indoctrinating them into not believing in the Guardians thus turning their worlds to ash and reducing the Guardians to frail and powerless beings. So North calls these childhood icons to meet at his workshop. As North tries to convince his very busy friends of a brewing evil, the Man in the Moon shows that there is a new Guardian being chosen to help the Big Four to fight Pitch. That new Guardian is, of course, Jack Frost. Jack at first starts off as a neutral party and wants nothing Thing to do with the Guardians. However, after not being believed in by anyone for his whole life and having the possibility of unlocking the secrets of his past, he helps the Guardians stop Pitch and in doing so, emerges a hero. Now, this isn't anything especially new in terms of storytelling. Reluctant hero, a villain threatening the balance of the world, learning about who you are from your past, fighting for what's right, you get the idea. But it's in the execution of this simple narrative where the movie really shines. The movie takes these treasured figures from our childhoods and portrays them as noble fantasy heroes, and their respective homes are meticulously crafted detailed worlds with their own unique magical quirks. The North Pole is a massive castle lodged in ice, with yetis making the toys instead of elves and a magical globe that alerts North of children in danger and, in this case, Pitch's influence and North himself possesses magic that he implements into his toys. Tooth Central Hub is a golden palace tucked away in a mountainside crevice, with millions of hummingbirds delivering teeth which in this universe contain precious memories of the children they come from. The Warren is my personal favorite setting in the movie. It's an underground forest with rolling mounds of land covered in moss and flowers. There are stone structures with ancient carvings, and an interconnected network of 
tunnels to deliver eggs through. And Sandy does this awesome shit. So obviously the animation is goddamn gorgeous. This is one of DreamWorks' most astounding visual achievements. This film was directed by Peter Ramsey, who also directed a small little independent film called fucking Spider-Verse! So yeah, that explains why this movie is so ambitious in its artistry. Ramsey's filmography may not be extensive, but what he lacks in quantity, he makes up for an impeccable quality. Also, hats off to art director Max Baus and his team. They went above and beyond beyond for this project. For example, in the North Pole, when they're standing around the fireplace, there's a tapestry hanging above the fireplace, and it gives you a little bit of a sense of the history of North. He wanted to live in isolation, and he befriended the Yetis, and together they built the North Pole. You see the level of detail when we're up close on the globe. Some etchings and the whole the elf language that we put into it, kind of describing where we are. Each column represents a continent, and each column has a different pattern to it, and these tooth boxes in them put an extra level of detail thinking about South American motifs, the Aztec designs. This is in the, the bunny worn, and these sentinel eggs look like old stone henge with old ancient carvings to them. So some of these old ancient carvings could be an egg or it could also be a set piece. They don't know if like an egg's gonna come to life. Those are all just really cool intricate stories that are in the backbone of the mythologies and we use those inspiration to create a unique look for each one of the world. And I was blown out of my mind to find out that master cinematographer Roger fucking Deakins was a visual consultant on this movie. That is Awesome! No wonder the camera work and color theory is on fucking point! And Guillermo del Toro produced it? This movie could not have had better people behind it. But the best part of this movie, aside from the visuals, is definitely the characterization and interaction. This cast brings these characters to life in the most humorous and engaging ways. That's Alec Baldwin and Hugh Jackman as North and Bunnymun. They have a very endearing soft rivalry where North is always egging him on about Christmas being better than Easter. Please, Bunny. Easter is not Christmas. <laughs> Here we go. North is an explosively creative and enthusiastic young soul inside a thick Russian dad bod. And surprisingly, Baldwin brings a very whimsical charm to the character while still maintaining a larger than life and intimidating demeanor. Bunny is a frantic, skittish, apprehensive sundere that isn't too keen on North's methods. But underneath his cynical and easily agitated exterior lies a hopeful optimism that he tries feverishly to bring to the children of the world. Tooth is bubbly, motherly, and sees the best in everyone. Her constant happiness is rather infectious, and her crush on Jack could have easily been unnecessary. But thankfully, their flirty rapport is actually kinda cute. This is one of the most peculiar, yet appealing designs I've seen for the Tooth Fairy. I mean, the Tooth Fairy in media has no consistent portrayal, aside from being nice and having amazing thighs. But this is a very original approach that asserts the film's creative and imaginative flair. Sandman doesn't speak a word, but so much of his nonchalant and tired personality is communicated through his face and body animation. Pitch is basically Loki if he was a lot more camp, Jude Law brings a deliciously over-the-top and sinister bravado to this character and makes him a lot more entertaining than he has any right to be. The one thing I always know, people's greatest fears, yours is that no one will ever believe in you. Teeth? Why do you care about the teeth? <gasps> Easy. You can't blame me for trying, Sandy. You don't know what it's like to be weak and hate it. It was stupid of me to mess with your dreams. So I'll tell you what, you can have them back. We'll give them a world where everything, everything is pitch black. And Jack Frost too. Now let her go. No. And Jack. 
As far as DreamWorks protagonists go, he's definitely one of the better ones. Nothing against the superior Shrek and Barry B. Benson. Jack starts off the story discovering his ice powers for the first time and the horrifying realization that he's invisible to everyone else. 300 years later, he seems like your typical bad boy, too cool for school reluctant hero archetype, but he desperately wants to be recognized by someone. He's been so alone for so long and the only other people that are like him don't get along with him. Ever since the moon brought Jack into existence centuries ago, he has questioned his purpose on Earth. And it's honestly a really compelling conflict. Like, I actually gave a shit about Jack. He wasn't just some pretty boy troublemaker. He's got a lot of weight to his character. If there's something I'm doing wrong, can you, can you just tell me what it is? Because I have tried everything, and no one ever sees me. You put me here. The least you can do is tell me... Tell me why. But, just the same way the Guardians bring wonder, hope, dreams, and MOTHERFUCKING MONEY to the children of the world, Jack brings fun and excitement into their lives, and that same fun and excitement can be an essential tool in this battle against fear. I also like the creative liberties they took with the character. Jack Frost isn't just Frost, he can control the wind, make snow days, blizzards, he's athletic, he's voiced by Chris Pine, and like I said before, the band and interaction these characters have are all just magnificent. The dialogue is insanely entertaining and charming as hell. Oh yeah! I love being shoved in a sack and tossed through a magic portal. Oh, good. That was my idea. Fuck it up! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where are the bloody safe belts? Ha! That was just expression. You know what? I've got something for you. Here it is. Look at all the pretty teeth. There's little blood and gum on them. No matter how much you paint, there's still a hey, Look, mate, I'm dealing with perishables. Sorry, not all of us get to work one night a year. Am I right, Sandy? <gasps> San Diego, sector two. You have got 30 seconds to return my fairies. Oh, you stick a quarter under my pillow. Hang on, is that Jack Frost? Since when are you all so chummy? We're not. Oh, good. A neutral party. Then I'm going to ignore you. But you must be used to that by now. What makes you think I want to be a guardian? <laughs> of course you do. Not to mention, I love how devoted they are to protecting the children of the world and to each other. These guys are a family, and you feel that bond between them. Like when North hatches a plan to have all of them collect the teeth for the Tooth Fairy to save her from being forgotten and her palace being destroyed. They all just agree with it, no questions asked. This is our duty. We're talking seven continents and millions of kids. Give me a break. You know how many toys I deliver in one night? And eggs I hide in one day. Like, that's such an awesome way to portray friendship without being all mushy and on the nose. I love it so much. The whole movie has this amazing kinetic energy that keeps the story moving, but never feels like it's rushing. And these characters, with their amazing personalities complemented by the wonderful animation, carry this film through the more, uh formulaic parts of the movie, where the characters have to hate Jack because it's the end of the second act and we need to, like, have a big sad now. The reason for this is because Jack gets lured into Pitch's lair with the promise of finding out his past. Okay, how did you find that in this mess of a memory pile? And because Jack got distracted, Pitch's nightmare horses killed all the cute egg people and there were no eggs for Easter, so the children don't believe in Bunnymon anymore. So when Jack shows up with his memory case, all the Guardians are like, holy shit, you left us to go find your own memories and let all of this shit happen? And then they have to hate Jack for a bit. Now don't get me wrong, as far as these end of second act misunderstanding cliches go, it's one of the less annoying ones, because mainly it does make sense. But it's just irritating that animated films feel they need to rely on this kind of plot point so much. And this is just something that personally bothers me, but wow, Jack fixed his staff way too easily. When Pitch breaks the staff, it's kind of a big fucking deal at first. Like, Jack feels physically 
physically hurt by it. And then he gets thrown down a chasm, and then Pitch, of course, drops the staff down the same chasm. And moments later, he just fucking fixes it. Like, what the fuck? But... I cannot go without mentioning the awesome backstory Jack has. Before Jack fixes his staff, he looks through his memory thingamajig and sees that in a past life, he was actually a pretty good kid. He was kind of the village trickster, but you can tell from these very brief flashes that he's very much loved by his family and friends. But one winter's day, he and his sister were out playing on thin ice, and she's about to plummet into the water. Jack keeps her calm by making her laugh by being his goofy self while simultaneously trying to save her, which he actually does. But then... Did you see... Did you see that? <laughs> it, it was... It was me! I had a family! I had a sister! I saved her! <laughs> That's why you chose me. I'm... I'm a guardian. Though it's definitely flawed, the good shit is way too good to keep overlooking. If you personally don't like the film, that's fine, but there needs to be more people at least giving this movie one viewing. Because this kind of talent going unnoticed by so many is very unfortunate. And this is kind of the point of this whole segment, really. To bring more attention to animated media that slips under the radar. I almost wish there was an official sequel or prequel or in between quill of this, but at the same time, I I'm immensely happy that we have just this standalone film untainted by corporate masterminds asserting their agendas onto it, Kennedy. And yes, I am aware of the book series, but I haven't read any of them yet. All I know is that North was a brutal Cossack turned inventor magician, and Bunny Mun is an interdimensional time lord. Huh. Well, I'm sure it makes sense in context. So next time, if you feel you have nothing to do, why don't you shimmy your ass on down to Netflix and give this underrated gem a watch? I can at the very least promise a dazzling visual experience, one you hopefully won't soon forget.